All right. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, to, for our 2022 board election open community forum. My name is Joy Garrett, and I'm the community contribution coordinator. And just a brief introduction, we are hosting this um, open forum so that we can all get to know our board election candidates a little better. So first I wanna say thank you to our candidates for um, answering our blog questions. And those are still available for everyone to read. Um, they're very thoughtfully answered. So I hope that everyone takes the time to check those out. But we recognize that people uh, receive information in tons of different ways. So we wanted to provide an, um, a visual and an auditory opportunity um, for people to learn more about each of the candidates. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce ourselves. So our name, our pronouns, and then maybe a short bio. And that can include some information about your involvement at Drupal, professional background, or any of your community interest. Would anybody like to get us started? On my screen, sure. um, Adam is right next to me, so I'm going to pass it to you. <laughs> uh, okay, well, John volunteered, but uh, I, I guess I'll jump in. So, Oh, uh, I'm sorry. It's my internet. <laughs> it's all good. I'm sorry. It's my internet connection. I did. <laughs> all good. Uh, so my name is Adam Bergstein. Uh, I've had a lot of different uh, roles in the broader Drupal community. Uh, I've contributed projects. Uh, I've worked at various companies at, in different capacities that have you know, used Drupal, contributed to Drupal, built products with Drupal, et cetera. Um, I've spoken at many community events, including DrupalCon. Um, and uh, I also, um, a few years ago, worked on a governance task force for uh, Drupal. Uh, and that was, I think, back in 2018, if I remember. Uh, so yeah, nice to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. And we can pass it over to John. Hey, good morning. Um, <clears throat> my name is John Doyle. Um, my pronouns are he, him. And uh, a little bit about myself. I've been working in the Drupal community, uh, mainly as a consumer of Drupal uh, for the last 12 or 13 years. Uh, started with Drupal 5, Drupal 6, and um <clears throat> have really done uh a whole wide spectrum of uh of, of work across enterprise across small business across um uh the community as well um just now getting more into the speaking side of things and and community contribution um but have done a lot of this on the enterprise side uh for companies and organizations in the past uh, really excited at the opportunity to be here, uh, and I'm really looking to give back and, and help push the Drupal community forward. Um, I currently run uh, an agency focused on open source technologies, and, and Drupal is about 85-90% uh, of our work. Um, so really excited to be in the space, really excited about the community. Um, met some of my best friends and, and co-workers uh, through the community, and, and really excited to keep this keep this moving. So that's it about me. Thanks for the time. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, my name is Mark Dorson. My uh, pronouns are he, him. Um, I've been involved in the Drupal community since 2008 is when I first started working with Drupal around the uh, Drupal 5 release of Drupal 6 timeframe. Uh, during that time, I've worked uh, as a developer, um, a contributor. Uh, I uh, am one of the partners and the CTO at Chromatic, which is a Drupal agency. Previous, or not exclusively a Drupal agency, but uh, a big chunk of our work uh, has always been and continues to be, uh, continues to involve Drupal in uh, various capacities. And previous to that, I was, uh, you know, worked uh in the publishing space and that's where i really got a ton of experience with drupal and um and how drupal um shines with uh, uh with tons of content uh i have contributed um to the drupal community as a um in code core contrib uh and i've also spoken and written about drupal for 
uh, a large number of those years, including speaking at DrupalCon. Thank you. All right, lastly, we have Babin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Pavel Joshi and I pronounce it as a him. I've been working with Drupal since 2007. I started with Drupal 5. It was fun uh, responding to Drupal forum since then, but uh, since we moved to Drupal Slack, uh, now I'm <laughs> working there, responding there. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Joshi Consultancy Services. We work with Drupal. And uh, we also putting efforts in building local communities. Uh, everyone is working in with Drupal, but they are not aware of contributing back to Drupal. So we have been putting some efforts here and building local communities. Let's see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing a little bit about yourself. Um, we're gonna jump into our Q&A portion. We have a few prepared questions for um, the community members to be able to get to know you and what you can bring, um, what your candidates can bring to the board. So um, we'll give everybody an opportunity to answer each question. So the first one that we're gonna start off with is what is your approach to building healthy team culture? What is your approach to building healthy team cultures? And we can kind of just popcorn. So if anybody would like to volunteer to answer first. Uh, I guess I'll go. Um, I don't see anybody else. Uh, going yet. Um, so my approach to building a healthy team culture is probably, I, I think, really just starts with uh, listening and connecting with people. Uh, I think it's really important to have opportunities to get teams together, to talk to them, whether it's Zoom or in person or whatever, uh, and, uh, you know, open up, um, ask, you know, questions, have retrospectives, talk through things uh, and observations that people see and understand. Uh, and I think um, you have to establish, you know, trust among the team and try to work to kind of build those bridges. And I think having those forums to talk through and, and understand and sort of connect with each other is, is a very important uh, way to do that. Uh, so that's really where I would start and I think um, I tend to be somewhat action oriented, though. So like uh, as you're kind of building those connections, what I am always like looking for or seeking are different opportunities to, you know, to take uh, things that are discussed and, and sort of materialize them in ways to make progress or help uh, people to take what they're saying or what they're sharing and and do something with it. So. Um, I think it's a great way to also show that, you know, you care about what other people are doing, what other people are thinking and trying to, to make something of it. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in after Adam. I, I think, I think that that's uh, a great answer. I also think that uh, healthy team cultures really start with, uh, I'm going to call it strong leadership. What I mean by that is setting a clear North star that the, that the team's working towards. Um, and, and to be clear, I don't mean uh, telling the team what to do, but making sure that everyone understands the combined mission of where we're going so that you can enable the team uh, to kind of build the platform uh, to, to get us there. Um, you know, and, and as leaders, you know, we need to provide the team with the tools, the resources, the guidance that they need to plot the course, uh, to build the road and to navigate uh, the terrain um, and allow that team to have the ownership uh, and, and the voice, as Adam was saying, uh, to be open and collaborative, have effective communication. Um, but I, I think, you know, as, as leaders, it's super important to kind of point the team uh, in the direction that they're going so that there's this combined understanding of what we're working towards and then provide the enablement uh, for the team to, uh, to kind of self-organize and, and drive that mission forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, Again, it's the strong, clear North Star uh, and extremely uh, important to open those communication channels and uh, and build that trust with the team. 
as Adam as Adam said. For me, uh, beyond some of the points that have already been shared, I think about how to create an environment that is uh, that feels collaborative for everyone on the team. Uh, I tend to um, uh, be relatively extroverted and uh, vocal about you know. I, I get excited and uh, about you know, solving some of these problems, but I want to make sure that um, my voice isn't overpowering others that you know are in the room. Especially if uh, you know I'm in a, a leadership role in the group, I want to make sure that uh, there's not that there is an opportunity for uh, for others to have the feeling that they can uh, bring their uh, ideas to the table and they're going to be evaluated and. Um, uh, considered and worked through, uh, and that it's not just an environment where, um, oh, well, this one person who is the leader or this one person who has been here a long time, uh, it's just, a, you know, that's what's going to um, be the direction. Um, some of the, you know, best uh, ideas often come from, uh, you know, others in the group uh, that are not in those positions. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to think about how to uh, create an environment where all of those voices are able to be heard. So uh, <clears throat> most of the points are already being covered. So I'm just going to add a few. The foremost thing is uh, taking the problem not the individuals or anything else other than problem. And the other one is the lead by example, when the leadership do something that inspires others in the team. Uh, a healthy culture is a healthy culture can be built. This way we can build a very healthy team culture. Thank you. I um, appreciate all of y'all's answers and I took away a lot from it that I would like to incorporate in my leadership uh, style too. So next on our list is, what is your approach to managing executive level leaders? What is your approach to managing executive level leaders? I'll go first. Um, I think for senior leaders, to me, the key thing is setting clear objectives and goals and letting them uh, figure out how they are going to execute and achieve those goals. Um, I tend to lean in this direction, whether, you know, in any kind of uh, level, um, but as people uh, become, you know, more senior, um, I think it's super important to trust them, not only that they know how to do the job, um, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, they're not going to thrive and be happy in whatever role or position they're in um, if, you know, you're micromanaging them in some way. Um, you want to give them the space to be able to, and frankly, they're going to hopefully be able to do a better job uh, at what, you know, what they're being asked to do than I or any of us would be able to tell them how to do. That's why they're in that role. Um, that's why they were hired in that role or placed in that role. Um, so, for me, the key thing is to set those um, criteria, those objectives, those metrics that are um, that are trying to be hit, and then um, you know getting out of their way and let them achieve that. Um, you know, and and being there to support them when they are in a position where they need or ask for assistance. I can. I can go next. Um, I think I think Mark hit it on the head. I think uh, you know managing senior leaders is not too different than managing anyone else, in, in my opinion, except for um, you expect more from them, um, and you, you you trust them to uh, deliver what they've been hired for and complement uh, the rest of the leadership team, um, and be clear leaders that that drive the mission forward. And I, I think a lot of the things that we said in building healthy team culture is important for managing senior leaders. It's setting the clear objective, setting the North Star and where we're going and giving them the tools and resources to be successful at their job and opening the communication channels for them to raise concerns, to um, communicate how things are going, what their needs are. Um, and if there's any blockers in the way so that 
you know, as <clears throat> as a board or as uh, other leaders, uh, you can support them in uh, getting unblocked or pushing them through or giving them the resources they need to be successful. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's the only thing I would add here. Um, so to what Mark already said. Bring next is it over? Yeah, so other than setting clear goal, I believe that uh, having a regular one-to-one uh, -one meeting as well as communicating regularly during the meeting and in writing helps uh, managing the executive level leaders well. And uh, this also allows them to grow individually as well as uh, uh, give enough freedom uh, to perform the task at hand. Cool, I guess I'm last. Uh, so um, I think the the big thing that comes to mind is uh, trust for me. And I think uh, you can, you know, really uh, each person's different. So you have to work to build a good rapport, whether it's with an executive leader or with anyone else. Uh, but I think uh, what's also really important is uh, the use of time. Like I know executive leaders are often uh, overseeing a lot, so you have to be very careful about not overcommitting them. Uh, asking uh, really good questions, trying to understand uh, why uh, there is a certain direction, and and try to uh, um, oversee that and go go through that uh, is super important uh, to make sure that you are using their time well. I think, and then also um, just ensuring that there's enough trust for you to execute on what an executive leader is looking for, uh, I think is really important. Uh, and I think um, always kind of building that trust uh, is is the, the key for that. Thank you all. All right, moving into our next question. How will you embed principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into your board seat if you are elected? How will you embed principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into your board seat if you're elected? Uh, maybe I'll start uh, with that since I went last last time. Uh, I think to me, it's just very important to ensure that the voices of the entire community are heard, right? I think uh, what I would look to do is honestly, um, you know, before the board meetings and before uh, taking up certain initiatives, I would actively seek different voices and different perspectives to try to understand their thoughts uh, before going into things. So I would try to be prepared. Uh, and honestly, um, I I think just on an ongoing basis, I want to make sure that um, if I'm lucky enough to to be the candidate, that I would hold forums, that I would listen and try to actively um, hear from from everyone uh, and uh, and I would want to uh, actively pursue folks that uh, you know want uh, want to have a voice and um, and try to magnify those voices so uh, that would be how I would handle it one thing that I think is um, a great asset to the Drupal community is the the work that's gone on by the diversity, equity, inclusion um, working group uh, and the collab, all the people that have collaborated uh, over the past many years in that. And so I would rely on input from uh, them and them in this case is anyone who is actively involved in those discussions um, about, you know, where are the blind spots? What's uh, what needs are being met, but more importantly, what needs are not being met um, and where can the Drupal Association, um, you know, help support those needs of the community and push the community forward in those areas? Okay, I will go next. Okay, the first thing is we need to make sure that we actually preach those principles, and uh, we need more representation from uh, on the represent section like region, or like race, and color. Uh, so we need to uphold 
this principle by introducing some better way. We already have some uh, ways in place, but we need better ways so that the, um, such people, such sections can actually uh, get, take advantage of it and build the part of the community in better way. Uh, the next is uh, we need to organize Drupal Cone other than North America and Europe, if not every year, every second year out of those regions. So this way, all the users as well as developers from such regions can take part in this event and feel connected. Usually what happens, <clears throat> the cost of traveling as well as certain Drupal Cone, Cone is, is at least half year of salary from such regions, not everyone can afford. So they do not participate or uh, even uh, uh, attend uh, the program virtually. Uh, so we need to do something better to feel them included. Yeah, I think I think you guys have done a really good job summarizing it. Um, I think from my perspective, um, making sure that any decisions are made um, are backed by uh, the the principles and of diversity diversity, equity, and inclusion set by the Drupal Association, having uh, a way to check any decisions that are made. Um, as Adam mentioned, going back to the community and making sure that those channels are open and, and collecting that feedback, I think is important. Um, and I think combining that with the working group and what we've learned so far uh, is, is gonna be important to <clears throat> helping us drive, uh, drive this program forward. I also think promoting these principles, uh, we'll look to, we, we should look to drive uh, engagement globally um, to engage new audiences and actually hear from, from what's going on there. Um, as Bobin said, you know, uh, DrupalCon India, I think was a big uh, benefit uh, when it was going on. I think we did some global events over the last couple of years with COVID, making sure that that gets, gets back. Um, I think South America was also one. I think that was held in Costa Rica previously. Um, and engaging with the, the, the local uh, organizations and in these different regions to hear from them, to understand uh, their needs, uh, because they are different than, than uh, other places across the world, um, and see what we can do to, to support and, and maintain that uh, wherever people are. Um, one of the things I love about this community is th there's people from all over the world uh, working on these projects. and. You know, uh, you pick up an initiative and you could have really someone across four different time zones, four different countries, four different languages working together. Uh, and I think that's what makes this community so special. Um, so continuing to foster that and, and push it forward is uh, is really important to me as well. I'd like to add one thing if I could. I think that, you know, all of us on this call have been involved in Drupal for quite a long time, but uh, I think a very important piece to um, furthering DEI in this community or any community is uh, figuring out how to uh, make it easier and more attractive for new people to, to come into the community. Uh, and I think that is a big responsibility, a big portion of uh, the responsibility of uh, the Drupal Association and how the Drupal Association can can help uh, the Drupal community and push it forward in that way. So uh, anything that we can do along those lines uh, in the is going to be a, a big help in the long term towards making the Drupal community more diverse and thereby improving um, the DEI experience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful answers. All right, our next question is, how might you engage the community in the current programs of the Drupal Association? How might you engage the community in the current programs of the Drupal Association? And once again, the questions are in the chat too, if you ever need to reference them again. All right, since I went last, I'll just follow the pattern and jump on this one. Um, I think there's ton of, tons of opportunities to engage the community as part of the current programs. Uh, I think being an active voice in the community is important uh, for, for anyone uh, that's representing the Drupal Association or involved in the Drupal project. I think there's opportunities through social media, webinars, in-person events to really champion not only the technology, but the, champ, uh, the community itself and the support system that it provides. 
Um, and I think uh, one of the things there is, is is a better opportunity to engage with new and existing community members, sponsors, and partners. Um, really want to highlight the partner part of this. I think uh, going to the sponsor channels and getting them to um, help promote and push it within their organizations is important. Um, I think there's great opportunity that lies with other open source projects and partnerships. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm really passionate about, and I think uh, I see a, a whole lot of uh, benefit for Drupal in the future is um, seeing Gatsby and, and Vercel uh, at DrupalCon, uh, I think was was great. Being able to engage with our partners for Decoupled, for Headless CMS, for the future of Drupal, um, to really enable our platform to engage with these newer platforms that is stealing market share of talent uh, it is important and continuing to use the channels that we have right now to, to work with these different uh, partner organizations, other nonprofit uh, associations and other open source platforms, uh, I think is, is, is key uh, in addition to our current community and sponsors uh, to be pushing the ecosystem forward. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's about getting the word out there, getting the content out there. Uh, making sure that we understand that, yes, we've been in the community for a long time, uh, at least everyone on this call, but there's a lot of new people that have never experienced Drupal before and haven't worked with the platform and uh, continuing to push that message and, and make sure that there's content for all levels and not taking for granted that everyone knows what Drupal is and how powerful it is and what, what it can do and highlighting those case studies uh, and, and really just flooding the market with content about how great the platform is um i think is uh is one way that we can leverage the existing programs and channels that we have set up uh to, to further this mission as we move into drupal 10 and, and what the future uh holds for us here yeah i had a few um i think the question was posed towards the current programs right so um i think for me a few really stand out uh one is the gitlab initiative that i think is quite quite the enabler to remove some of the more Drupal centric things and make it uh, workflows and tooling that the community uh, at large can benefit from that's more common, more commonplace. Uh, I really like that. I also really like uh, the Discover Drupal initiative. I think that hits what John was talking about, about trying to position Drupal to tell its story. Uh, that's a, a crucial thing, I think, to to helping uh, get new market for Drupal um, and, and you know, pitch our identity. Um, but the one I, I would say I'm, I'm really passionate about right now is I think it's a newer initiative and I forget the exact name of it, but there's uh, programs, training programs that are put in place with people that are outside of the community uh, that are, uh, I think, partnering with uh, Drupal Easy, if I remember, uh, to, to help train new community members. Uh, and I think that's a great way to, um, you know, not only get new community members, but also to, to show that kind of outreach of like what we really care about as an open source community, uh, which I think is about, you know, helping uh, people, you know, learn this, this great skill and be able to do something with it in the future. And that can be a game changer for people's lives and, and helping uh, do not only do great things in the community, but also, um, you know, be able to have a job and work and and provide for uh, themselves after that, which is is great. Um, and so I really like that program a lot. Uh, and uh, I want to let me make sure I understood the question. How might you engage a community? So I I would just want to like you know maybe with the GitLab initiative, I would want to sit down and see, hey, is this working for you? Are there ways to improve it? You know, maybe get on a Zoom call and talk through it. But also, um, you know, engaging the community around, you know, are there ways we can improve, you know, the training program and things of that nature or the ways that we need to tell uh, Drupal's story better? I'd like to hear from people on that. You know, uh, I have my own thoughts as well, but um, I think just making sure that there's, you know, good communication between the community and these efforts, I think, is really critical uh, because these efforts can have significant impact and they already are. Uh, so I think it's important to continue that uh, conversation. Beyond what's been shared, I think the, you know, the 
Discover Drupal has been incredible. The GitLab acceleration, I've been uh, uh, a participant and follower of. Um, I think the Drupal uh, Association staff has done a great job of um, communicating out, you know, the GitLab acceleration has is a great example of that. And there's been regular meetings that anyone can attend. And as a, you know, as a community member, I've been able to participate and do all those things. I would like to, beyond those things, I would like to see uh, the board, if I'm elected as a member, be more transparent and um, open with uh, not just the decisions that are being made once they're made, but also, you know, they're thinking in the direction where things are being pushed. Um, as a community member, uh, for many years, I've attended the, the pu yearly public uh, board meeting at, that happens at DrupalCon. Um, but beyond that, it's sometimes a challenge to access uh, what's going on at the board level, um, you know, even for things that you know, really should be fine to be made public. Um, you know, if you go on the board meetings page on the Drupal Association site right now, uh, the published schedule for board meetings, I believe, is from 2019. Um, so, you know, there's more that can be done uh, to at the board level uh, to get people involved um, and let their voices be heard. Uh, and, you know, create the next crop of people that will be uh, interested in running for a position like this uh, in a number of years or next year. So uh, that would be important to me as well. Okay, so it's my turn, right? Okay, so uh, I'm from India, so I'll talk about India. Uh, here we have uh, lots of developers, companies are working on Drupal. And the percentage uh, who, who are actually contributing back to Drupal is not even 5% of all the remaining. So we need to we need to do something that uh, those organizations as well as those developers are encouraged and motivated to contribute back to Drupal. And uh, frankly speaking, they, are, they have no idea that, that they can contribute back to Drupal. So we have to uh, do something uh, such that they get awareness about this and actually engage with the community. They do not even post in Drupal forums or even respond to Drupal forum questions. They just uh, consume whatever is being presented to them on Drupal.org. So we have to put some efforts such that uh, those remaining people, developers as well as organizations take part in all the initiatives and programs. Yeah, you just mentioned about the, the, that program, but uh, no one knows uh, about that program here. So we have to do something about this. Thank you all for your answers. Our next question is, what would your strategy, what would be your strategy for recruiting new members to Drupal Association? What would be your strategy for recruiting new members to Drupal Association? I'm not very much aware about uh, operation uh, at the DA, but from my experience, I can say that uh, we need to find the person who is best fit for the particular task or job. And while doing that, we need to make sure that we uh, distribute this opportunity equally across all the section of the community. Um, I, I think the approach here would be similar to the approach for engaging in some of the existing programs and helping uh, grow the voice of Drupal and the association and what Drupal stands for. Um, I think it really is about uh, informing people of what we're great at, what Drupal can provide. Uh, we're not just another CMS uh, that's out there that um, can build websites. We're a platform for engagement, for uh, bringing in community members, for uh, integrating with 
uh, other frameworks and platforms and we make it easy and we support our community to do it. Um, like I said earlier, I think a lot of talent market share is going to more JavaScript frameworks and people think it's uh, newer and, uh, and more fun uh, to work on. I mean, I hear that from people in the community all the time. They're, they're looking to get into React and, and play with these frameworks. And I think the more we can do about, um, again, enabling us as a platform that works alongside those that easily integrates with these platforms that uh, is something that they can work on with these platforms, uh, I think is gonna be beneficial. Um, and I think there's opportunity to continue growing the footprint of Drupal, getting people excited about it. Um, and I think what we need to do here is not just focus on the traditional CMS part. Um, I think the Site Builder Initiative is great. I think it's gonna support uh, the future of the content management space. I think we need to get there. Um, I think we need to put uh, as much weight on the headless version of this for the integrations with the partners and with these JavaScript frameworks that people want to work with. Um, and I think there's opportunities to engage other open source uh, pro projects here um, and work with other other projects to uh, further the footprint of both uh, uh, technologies and work together in this ecosystem. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all passionate about open source. We want to push Drupal and we want to support the platform. Um, and I think we can do that by uh, attracting talent and building programs that get people excited about it. Um, and, you know, something I've seen a lot less of is, is organized training. And I think Adam mentioned the Drupal Easy program. I think that's really important. I think uh, I know some of uh, people in my network have been doing speaking at uh, universities, especially in India, um, to try to get new um, new students interested in exposure to the platform. And I think uh, there's other uh, industries doing this uh, with with other platforms. And I think if if we really want to be serious about attracting new talent to the ecosystem, uh, we need to look at supporting uh, supporting these engagements to go out and actually do trainings at universities, get people exposure to these technologies when they're coming out of school. So they're looking for jobs uh, that are relevant to Drupal, not just uh, React and, you know, uh, uh, these other frameworks, um, you know, PHP might, might be falling behind a bit compared to that. And just making sure people understand the power uh, of, of the platforms and what they can provide and how the community is supporting them. Uh, I think it's gonna be really important moving forward. Uh, for recruitment. Um, I wanted to go back, uh, sorry, Mark. Um, I actually wanted to go back to what Mark had shared a little bit earlier, which is around transparency of like the Drupal Association, the board and, and where things are going. I think that's a great way to um, get people excited about, you know, what the Drupal Association is doing and, and uh, becoming a member of it to help support that. Um, I think they, uh, and I also think it's important that uh, the DA continues to advocate for the the value that it is adding, like the programs that are going on right now, which I think are super important. Um, and uh, I think the community will continue to support the DA and even that will grow, um, you know, when people get excited and understand exactly, you know, where things are going. And I think that's where I would probably invest uh, most of my energy into um, at least trying to tell that story and share that and get people to say, hey, we need to support this and uh, and try to, if you're not a member, you should be a member uh, to help make sure that we can go in this direction. But hopefully that would be informed by, you know, what community members are excited about and they would be more inclined to to want to sign up. So. I think um an interesting part of this conversation is, you know, and probably outside the scope of this here, but an important job for the Drupal Association is to uh, do a good job of making clear to the community where the responsibilities of the Drupal Association end and where and where the responsibilities of the community begin. And, and what is that line? I don't know that it's, I think that's been a challenge for a long time, especially as new people are coming into the community. It's not, uh, always clear what that delineation is. And if we're talking about driving uh, more membership and engagement with the Drupal Association specifically, um, 
you know, I think essentially in most cases, what we're doing is we're asking, we're asking for some their money. Uh, and uh, that's very important to the Drupal Association because um, a huge percentage of the Drupal Association's revenue comes from events in DrupalCon North America specifically. So, you know, what we saw a couple of years ago with COVID was when DrupalCon North America didn't happen, it was a true crisis for the Drupal Association financially. Um, there was, uh, you know, a question of whether the Drupal Association would be able to survive that moment. Um, and so I think since at that moment, certainly, uh, not that it was a new discussion, but that moment made it very tangible and real for the Drupal Association uh, as a whole, the Drupal community as a whole, that, you know, what would it mean to uh, the Drupal community if the Drupal Association uh, ceased to exist? Um, and most people didn't like the answer to that. And there was a big uh, effort to, to assist, but, you know, as we look forward, I really want to focus on like, how do we um, make sure that the Drupal Association, that we lessen the possibility, the chance, the risk that the Drupal Association is ever in that position again. So how do we do, a, a, you know, continue to push forward and diversifying the Drupal Association's revenue uh, so that uh, disruptions like COVID, if something like that were to happen again, uh, would not be as big of a crisis. Um, and, you know, how do we look at uh, in the, the ways that the Drupal Association is spending uh, their dollars and, uh, you know, to make sure that they're the, you know, being spent in the ways that are making the biggest impact pos uh, possible for the Drupal community. Um, so for driving individual memberships, we're asking for people's dollars. Uh, how do we make sure that we're showing that we are delivering them value uh, and that the Drupal Association um, is delivering the community value and them value specifically so they're able to say it's a no brainer for me to renew my uh, Drupal Association membership like I get way more value out of this The community gets way more value out of this uh, than what I'm being asked to contribute. Thank you, everyone. And Mark, that's a good segue into our last um, question. What is your approach to nonprofit fundraising and philanthropy? What is your approach to nonprofit fundraising and philanthropy? All right, I'll take this one. Um, I think uh, my approach for nonprofit fundraising and philanthropy is really to engage both new and existing audiences that are interested in making an impact uh, with open source. I think we need to be aware that there's really three different personas when we look at uh, fundraising and philanthropy for nonprofit. We've got uh, groups of people that wanna put in their time uh and improve the community whether that's through contribution that's volunteering we see this at drupal cons we see this at uh the drupal association and uh people who are volunteering to support that we've got people that are looking to donate money uh they don't they don't want to uh really be uh a force of action themselves but they want to contribute back to the community and and give back uh to the association um and uh you've got both um, strategic, uh, sorry, the third, the third one is strategic advisors. People are looking to further the direction of Drupal to uh, encourage where we're going from here and provide the insights into uh, what's going to keep the community and the project uh, moving forward in the direction that's going to keep it alive and keep it uh, prosperous and, and push it forward. And I, I think we really need to build action plans against all three of these uh, audiences together. Uh, or sorry, individually, um, and we can target these different channels based on these personas the same way you would with any business and marketing. Uh, really understanding these different groups, what their needs are, and how we engage with them, uh, I think is super important. Um, 
And, uh, you know, uh, tying it to the last question, expanding the community, uh, you know, not everyone in the community is going to contribute back uh, to it. Uh, we know that it's just, it's a fact. Um, and uh, continuing to expand the community uh, is, is, a, is a necessity to increasing the amount of involvement uh, in the community and it, it will help with the fundraising and philanthropy. So I think that they really are tied together. And again, it's uh, how do we build the programs for each of these personas uh, to further uh, that those fundraising efforts and and that that uh, you know that giving back and make sure that we're addressing their needs. Um, so dedicating the time uh, to to do that to understand these personas and build action plans against them, I think is uh, is is where it start. Um, I know some of this is is already out there, um, and the, the the board is working on this, but um, I, I think there's more that we can do in this space. My answer would go along some of the themes that I've spoken about previously, but I think that, you know, it, it feels similar to um, getting someone, encouraging someone to join the Drupal Association or whether we're talking about philanthropy and fundraising. I think about, you know, sharing a vision that inspires them. Um, and, you know, whether that's at a smaller level or a larger level, feeling like they're a part of the community, feeling like they they want to work towards that vision, whether it is, whether with, um, you know, uh, monetary contributions or with their time um, and, you know, selling them on that vision, uh, getting the community aligned around that vision and um, hopefully with a level of transparency that is able to, you know, able to achieve that uh, even more than we have in the past. Um, if we can inspire people um, in that vision, then they're going to want to be a part of that effort, uh, whether it's with uh, money or time. Uh, I guess I'll go next. So I, where my brain goes uh, in this question is really around commercial partners, right? There's a whole... Um, space of you know community members and i think they already are you know they already do have memberships uh some people have reasons why they don't want a membership we should try to to continue to promote that but i think the real opportunity is around commercial partners that are using drupal or have adopted drupal or you know are uh there, there's that blog post the makers and the takers right and uh, the makers are often the contributors and they're the ones that are involved in speaking and whatnot uh, and the takers tend to be, there's some very, very large uh, commercial entities that are uh, using Drupal, right? And I think there's a very real opportunity to try to engage them uh, in strategic ways to not only raise funds, but to help um, ensure they're aware of their responsibility for keeping the community and, and the Drupal Association afloat. Um, and it needs to be you know, uh, an incentive for them as well. So there should be some benefit to that. And I think that's the space of what I would want to dig into is how to raise funds in that regard and how to, um, you know, drive um, more goodwill coming from, from that side of uh, the community. I'll go next. Uh, the foremost thing is... Uh... We streamline the donation as well as membership uh, uh, process uh, further. It is easier now, but can make it further easier by introducing some feeds and uh, offering less feeds uh, when filing the form. Other than that, we can ask our partners and members to put a link in their website footer asking whether you are if you are benefited from this Drupal project. Please consider donating or becoming a member. And the third one is we need to put a very visible link somewhere on the Drupal or website where it clearly says donate or become a member. Right now we don't have it uh, not have it on the website. So sometimes members get uh, users get confused and they actually do not do anything. Uh, 
All right. Thank you all for answering all those questions so thoughtfully. As somebody who's like who's new to the association, I learned a lot and took a lot away from your responses. So thank you for sharing your insight and your perspective and your passion with the rest of the community. And before we go into our closing and um, I give a few announcements, I just wanted to uh, create space if anybody wanted to share anything or um, have any closing remarks before we close this out. All right. Well, just a reminder to everyone, um, some key important dates. Um, in order to be able to vote, you have to be an active Drupal Association member, and that has to be 24 hours before voting begins, so that happens to fall in 0100 UTC on September 20th, and voting begins on September 21st, and it'll close on October 19th. After the voting closes, the board will ratify um, between October 20th and the 31st, and then we're going to announce the new board member on November 1st. So please make sure that your uh, membership is active and um, we'll be sending out more information when voting begins. Thank you all for, um, for being with us and being present in this time and looking forward to connecting with you all later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, everyone.